sound. I hear it in the thunder and rain. It's ringing in the sky like cannons in the night. The music of the universe plays. But we're singing, You are holy, great and mighty. But still you love me forever my heart will sing of how great you are. Yes. Beautiful and free, the song of galaxies reaching far beyond the Milky Way. Let's join in with the sound. Come on, let's sing it loud as the music of the universe plays. We were singing, you are holy, great and mighty. The moon and the stars declare who you so unworthy, but still you love me forever. My heart will sing of you. All glory, honor, and power is yours. Amen. All glory, honor, and power is yours. Amen. All glory, honor, and power is yours. us all together now. Oh, you are holy, great and mighty, the moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still you love me forever. My heart will sing. So glad you're here with us this morning. Wherever you are, your kitchen, your living room, let's put our hands together. It's a great day to praise the Lord and clap in His presence. Amen. this together. Our God, a firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. The nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong now shake and we trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. Trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are the 
Justice, you will reign. Every knee will bow. We bring our expectations. Our hope is anchored in your name. The name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. King forever, Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forever. You are victorious. You are the only King forever, Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. From age to age you reign, your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high, we lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign, your kingdom has no end. You are the only king forever, almighty God we lift you higher. Forevermore, you are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. Good morning, church. We are so glad you're joining us this morning, wherever you are. It is a great day to praise the Lord. And I thought in, in light of everything going on in the world, and even here in the valley, and when's our city going to start opening up again, and we have job losses and wages losses and, and sickness and uh, schools, work, everything's upside down. And I thought about uh, this story. It happened back in the year, the year 1714, a long time ago. Queen Anne was uh, queen of England, and uh, she grew deathly ill in the summer of 1714. And the country was in panic because they weren't sure what was going to happen in the future. They were uncertain. They were nervous. Uh, and there was a pastor named Isaac Watts, and he is a great, one of the greatest songwriters of all time. And uh, he was actually pastoring a church at this time, and he saw the panic in his church family and throughout the country. And so he sat down and penned a hymn, and it was inspired by Psalm 90, and the name of the hymn is, O oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. And here's just a couple, a couple verses from the psalm. Lord, through all the generations, you have been our home. For you, a thousand years are like yesterday. Teach us to make the most of our time so that we may grow in wisdom. And let us see your miracles again. Let our children see your glory 
at work. And as we continue to worship this morning, let's keep in mind and, and trust God's word and trust God himself that he has been our help in ages past and he is our help today and he's going to be our help into the future. So let's sing this great song and continue to sing truth about God and sing our praises. Amen. Christian Church. We are so delighted that you chose to be with us this morning. Our friends, our neighbors, our family, those watching around the world, thank you for tuning in. Uh, this week, our prayer point is just focused around COVID-19, this invisible enemy that we've been fighting, that we've all, uh, by now, one way or the other, have been affected by this. I just ask that you would take this time this morning and pray with us. Father God, we are so thankful for your love, grace, and mercy. Lord, we, we just ask that you would be with the leaders of this country as we look to open uh, the America again for, for business. As we open the world, would you be with the leaders? Holy Spirit, you are here during creation through all of the land over the whole world, and I just ask that you would empower those, those that are making decisions, 
the health physicians, the ones that are making uh, just decisions on how we should move forward, would you just enable them? Would you guide them? Father God, please be with us, those that are sick, those that are still healing. Father, would you heal them? Would you give them comfort? Would you give them strength? Lord, all the, the parents as teachers, the kids, Father, as, as we open everything up and we start moving again, would you just uh, help us stay calm? Would you give us this sense of peace? Because, God, we know that you are in control and things will move at your speed. We just ask that you, uh, you just help us recognize that all of this is in your timing, Father, and that we would just put our hope, our trust in you. Father, just heal this land. We love you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Southeast Christian Church and everybody else who's watching. Hey, let me ask you a question. How are you doing? We've been in this situation now for about a month, and I know that for a lot of people it's, well, it's hard. It's difficult. And as we're navigating these new waters, certain emotions come up in our hearts. Maybe you've had a fear kind of rise to the surface. Maybe your anxiety level is getting higher. Maybe it's just being so cooped up that you find your anger bursting out. There are a lot of different emotions that we're feeling. Some of you are, are not in those moments. Some of you are actually um, trying to better yourself. You've moved from fear and getting by to let's take this moment and let's move forward with our goals that we set at the beginning of the year. So let me ask you, how, how are you doing? I just want to encourage you. We would love to pray with you. We would love to pray for you. You can comment, in the, in, uh, you can comment on the, the live stream. You can send us an email. You can go to the website, www.southeast.cc, and fill out a, a tangible needs form or a prayer form or whatever you need. But I just want to remind you that we're here for you. And, and we love you, and we are with you, and we just keep holding on to the promise that Jesus gives us his grace in moments like these. And so as we look at these uncertain times, there's um, a book of the Bible that comes to mind. It's, it's Hebrews. And so today we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 1, and that's kind of the, for the next few weeks, we're going to be walking through this book. And I think it's because they were in uncertain times. The book of Hebrews was written to people who were going through troubles. They were going through tribulations. They were, they were uncertain about what the future holds. Let me give you a little bit of background. You know, Jesus came. Last week we celebrated Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And then he ascended into heaven. And his church began to grow. It began to spread from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. Jesus was building his church 
But as the church began to grow, there was persecution that came. There was an emperor, his, his name was Nero, and he was a, a terrible person when it came to um, a lot of things. And primarily, it, it was, he was terrible towards Christians. And, and the, the, oftentimes, they would be scapegoats. And, and here's, what, here's what Tacitus said, the Roman historian. Here's what, here's what Tacitus said about, about the Christians. He says, their death was made a matter of sport. This was Nero. Their death was made a matter of sport. They were covered in wild beast skins and torn to pieces by dogs or were fastened to crosses and set on fire in order to serve as torches by night. Nero had offered his gardens for the spectacle and gave an exhibition into, in his circus, mingling with the crowd in the guise of a caricature or mounted on his chariot. Hence, there arose a feeling of pity because it was felt that they were being sacrificed not for the common good, but to gratify the savagery of one man. You see, here, here's what happened. As the church began to grow and began to spread across the Roman world, they were targets. The Christian church was a target for people. And Tacitus, was, or Tacitus reports that Nero was so vicious that, that they kind of went past the lie of this is for the common good, and people began to have pity on the Christians because of the persecution that they were fearing. And that was happening, and in the meantime, Jerusalem was being sieged, it was being surrounded. In 70, Titus destroyed the, the, city of, the city of Jerusalem. And as they were surrounding, he did this uh, near Passover, and, and during Passover, the city was around 40,000 people, but during Passover, it would increase to 125,000, and some estimates even as high as 250,000. The historian Josephus claims, claims that 1.1 million people were killed during the siege and destruction of Jerusalem. Josephus also points out that the Roman soldiers, as they stood watch, they got tired of killing people. A Roman soldier who was trained to follow Caesar said, you know what, I'm, I'm good, I've killed enough. There's too much blood on my hands. I can't do this anymore. I would think that those were uncertain times. And I think that there's a difference in that when you were sitting in Jerusalem and you were looking out, you saw your enemy. And right now, we don't really even see our enemy. This virus that has spread throughout the world, we don't know that much about it. In fact, in a lot of cases, we're just guessing. And so we are in uncertain times. But what I do appreciate is that as the city of Jerusalem was surrounded, as the, perse as the persecution was happening to the church of Christ, as these things were unfolding... The author of Hebrews sits down and he says, you need to know this. And I think that right now as we practice social distance, I think right now as instead of meeting face to face and embracing each other, as we're meeting over Zoom calls, as we're watching the news carefully, I think the author of Hebrews could sit down and say, you know what? You need to know these things. And so we're going to start with Hebrews chapter 1. And here's what it says. Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things. Through whom also he created the world. I just want to talk a moment about the last days. Uh, a lot of people have contacted me. They say, Mike, is, is Jesus coming back? And I always tell them, yes, it's probably when you're in the middle of a sin. So quit sinning. 
No, I, I, here's the thing, is that since a, a lot of people, just stop watching those videos, okay? <laughs> just stop watching. They make you nervous. Yes, Jesus is coming back, but we don't know the day or the hour. He is coming back for his church. He is coming back for his bride. He is coming back for those who have surrendered his, their lives to him. But what this phrase, this last days is, is a lot of people will make a lot of money because they'll post videos and they'll sell books and And here's the thing, though, is that we've been in the last days since Jesus ascended into heaven. Uh, Look at at this. It says, belief in Jesus' words accompanies belief in God by his ministry. Climaxing in his death and resurrection, Jesus began a new era called the last days. Here, as the book begins, the message from Jesus is central. The message from Jesus is central. As though the last days is the time when the words of Jesus are predominant. Replacing the partial message, messages of the past, which found their completion in his new message about his new work in his new era. If this reasoning is correct, then we have been in the last days since Jesus walked the earth. Since Jesus' words have not been replaced by any other words, We are still in the last days. We are in the last days since the time that Jesus walked on this earth, was crucified, was buried, and rose again and ascended into heaven. This is the era that we live in. It's been going on now for 2,000 years. And so as, as the Hebrew, as the Jewish Christians were in Jerusalem, when they were in Rome, and they're looking and they're wondering, why is this persecution happening? The author says, hey, you need to know something. You're in the last days. And what he says is that Jesus is who we've been waiting for. He is still the Messiah. Because here's the thing, is that when life is uncertain, we tend to try and grip things. We try and hold on to things. This last year, I I made a a benchmark in the numbers that we count. And the benchmark was I turned 40. Now, to to just kind of give you a a little bit of background to this... um, it had snowed, and so I got up, and uh, I, I did some things at my mom's house, and I was going out to the van, and as I was getting things out of the van, I slipped, and I fell right on my, we'll just leave it at that. But the next Sunday, I was standing on this stage, and some of you remember this, and I fell off the stage, and I thought to myself, Is this how it's going to be? You turn 40 and you just start falling? No no rhyme or reason, you just fall down? But what happens is that in that moment of uncertainty, as you're falling down to the ground, you reach out for something and you try and grip something. And the same thing happens when we don't know where our life is taking us. As we're looking at this pandemic, some of you had incredible job security. And now it's up in the air. Some of you had, had, were managing your health well, but maybe you have asthma and now your health is up in the air. You see, there's a lot of things that, that can kind of shake us and kind of flip us off balance. And so the question is, is when you get off balance, what do you grip for? What do you reach for? What do you hold on to. And the author of Hebrews looks at us and he says, hey, when when life is uncertain, when the world around you is shaking, you have Jesus and you have his words. And look at what he says, continuing on. Look at what he says in verse 3. He says, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe By the word of his power, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, at the right hand of the majesty on high. And we're going to come back to that. But what he's saying here, what he's getting at is he's saying, look, when life is uncertain, you have to hold on to Jesus. Do not let go of Jesus. And so as he's writing to this audience, there were a few things that the audience probably would have been doing. 
One of the things that the, the Hebrew writers it points out is that as these people were going through their persecution, as they were going through their troubles, they were holding on to their past religion. They were holding on to the past sacrificial system. Many of them were thinking, man, if we're, under, if we're going through this persecution, if we're going through this tri- tribulation, God must be angry m- with us. Maybe Jesus wasn't the f- Messiah. Maybe Jesus wasn't the Christ. Maybe Jesus wasn't the person that we've been waiting for. Maybe if we turn back, if we per- turn back to Judaism, then God will have favor with us and the persecution will end. The persecution will stop. The, the uncertainty, the not knowing, the, the angst that I get in my, my stomach, the anxiety that I'm feeling, the fear of going out into the marketplace, maybe, maybe all of that stuff will, will stop if we just go back to what we thought was true. So how are you doing? Are you, are you continuing to hold on to Jesus or maybe you've slipped back into your old way of life. Maybe you've slipped back into some old habits. Maybe you, you've slipped back into some old ways of doing life. Maybe you've slipped back into some old coping mechanisms. Maybe you've slipped back into fear. Fear. And so the author takes Hebrews and he tells the congregation to say, look, here is Jesus and here's the direction that you're going. Look, Jesus is better than that. Now one thing that you need to know that in Jewish culture, angels were significant. They were the ones that brought the the law to Moses and uh, from God, but they were deliverers, they were messengers, and so the author begins to show them, look, Jesus is better than the sacrificial system. He's our final solution. He is the, the person that we've been waiting for, for, for sin. He purified us, but, but let me show you something. He is better than the angels. And so I'm just really going to quickly go through this, but look at what he says here. Having become as much superior to the angels as the name has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. There's a lot in that verse, but here's the the point that I'm going to draw out of it is this. Jesus was deity. Jesus was deity. He is God. He never said that about the angels. The angels were messengers. They were servants. But, but with Jesus, there is a deity about him. And then he says this, I, or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes the angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. He points out that Jesus accepted worship. God tells us to worship Jesus. But the angels, they're fleeting. They're fleeting. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of unrighteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and and hated wickedness. Therefore, God... Your God has anointed you with all the gladness beyond your companions. Of his son, of Jesus, God has exalted him above all of creation. Above everything that God spoke into existence, Jesus is exalted. He never said that about the angels. Can you see what the author is doing here? He's looking at this people and he's saying, look, you're wanting to go back to that old system. You're wanting to go back to your old way of life. You're wanting to go back there, but... But Jesus is better. Look how much, look how better Jesus is. In verse 10, and you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed. But you are the same and your years will have no end. This is all of creation at some point 
is going to fade away. But Jesus never will. You see, there's a point where this virus will be done. It will be finished. We won't have to worry about it anymore. But as the virus, as the world fades away, Jesus remains the same. Exalted above all creation. And look at what he says here then. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. What he says is that the first time Jesus came in grace, the second time Jesus is going to come with a sword. You see the argument that the author is making? Don't go back to the old way of life. Don't go back to the angels. Don't go back to Moses. Don't go back to the old sacrificial system. And we'll get to some of those things over the next couple of weeks. But right now, don't let go of Jesus. And I think, I think it is impossible. It is impossible to overstate the supremacy of Jesus. It is impossible to overstate the supremacy of Jesus. And so here's our application then. In uncertain times, in uncertain times, don't let go of Jesus. Don't let go of Jesus. And like I said, we were going to go back to those two verses. Look at Hebrews 1, 2 through 3, and I just want to unpack these for a moment. Because as you're looking at the thing in your hand and you're saying, should I go back to this way of life? Let me just point out what the author of Hebrews pointed out. This is the Jesus that you and I worship. Look at what it says. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of, the nat- of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Let me, just give you, give me, let me just give you seven attributes of what the author tells us. This is this Jesus that we worship. This is Jesus. The first one is this. He's the heir of all things. All things were made for him, and every knee will bow. At some point, every knee will bow down to Jesus. You see, in this moment of uncertainty, we tend to go back to our old habits. We, again, we try and reach out and hold something tangible. We try and reach out and hold something to, to ignore our fears, to calm our fears. And, and what this author is saying, hey, don't, don't, don't do that. You don't need to do that. Jesus is your king. He is the heir of all things. And right now, right now, the world is worshiping him. This last week, um, I've, we, we, you watch things on the news and you hear reports and that type of stuff. And I was looking at this one streaming service. This one streaming service. A lot of churches have jumped on board. Thankfully, we were at Southeast. We were already kind of moving in that direction for an online ministry and that type of stuff. So we were in the water already. But there were a lot of churches that were not. And there's one particular online service that, that streams services for churches. They serve churches that way so that, they can, so that they can get the word out, they can get the gospel out. And this, church was, this, this service was saying that before coronavirus hit, there were 3,000 churches on board for streaming live services. And now they're up to 23,000 churches using their services. And that's just one service. Some of you right now that are watching, you would never step foot in Southeast Christian Church. For whatever reason, you would never come to, to a church service. But because now that it is online, because now we are, we are shouting through technology, Jesus is Lord, something got your attention and you're saying, hey, there, there might be something about this Jesus. You see, at some point, Jesus is, Jesus is heir of all things, and at some point, every knee will bow. Don't go back to your old way of life. Don't go, there's no salvation there. Don't go back to your old way of life. Look at this, number two. Through him, he made the world. Nothing was made without him. 
You know, it's amazing to me. God spoke things into existence. Let there be light, and there was light. And, and, and John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That the Word put on flesh. It's amazing to me that this Word, this, this spoken Word, the Logos, put on flesh and, and is Jesus. That, that, that's amazing to me. Don't go back there. When we think about these things, we, we look and we see how many things that we thought were certain just a couple weeks ago, and now we're realizing they're, they're fleeting. But there's something about the eternal word of God. There's something about those ancient words that stand the test of time, and that's who Jesus is. He's the word of God. Look at this, though. Number three, he's the radiance of glory. And just a quick thing about this is that, you know, when we think about, when we think about shining lights, there's, there's either the, the reflection or there's the, it's generated by whatever it is. And so a lot of times we think, like, here's the illustration. Look at the moon, and it's a reflection of light. But when you look at the sun, the sun is creating the light. It's radiating the light, That's what we have in Jesus. He's not a reflection of the light, but his very self, his very nature, his very image. He's reflecting the glory of God. And that word glory is doxa. And when we talk about the glory of God, it was the presence of God that was in the temple. He's not reflecting that glory that was in the temple. He is that glory. He's radiating radiating that glory out from his person. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Here's number four. He's the imprint of his nature. The brilliance, the majesty of of Jesus is the the brilliance and majesty of of God. The imagery that the author is using is is that of a stamped coin or a signet in sealing wax. Literally, he's God's underlying reality. It's his substance. And here's the thing. When you look at God, you see Jesus. Jesus. When you look at Jesus, you see God. Here's number five. Again, he upholds the world by his word. We talked a little bit about it because he made everything in the world through his word. The Logos became flesh, John 1.14. And in him, all things hold together, Colossians 1.17. Here's this, though. He made purification for sins. Number six, he made purification for sins. He provided grace. We see that in the cross. You see, here's the thing is, I'm a sinner. I freely admit that to you. If you follow me around for long enough, you will look at me and you'll say, or you'll whisper to one of your your friends and say, he's a pastor? (laughs) Yeah. Because we're all broken people. We've, we've all sinned. We've, we've all done things that we know that we shouldn't do. We, we've all not done things that we know that we should have done. And because of that, there's a brokenness that we can experience. There's a brokenness that we, that we feel between God and us and between our relationships. And here's the thing. that Jesus came and he died for that brokenness. He died for that sin. He became that brokenness and was crucified on a cross in our place. Jesus died the, the death I should have received and he gave me the life that he lived. Jesus is the purification. Jesus made the purification for sins. And here's the last one. As we're going through the list, six things, here's the last one. This is the, the pinnacle, if you will, the climax. And here it is. He, he sat down. He sat down. You say, Mike, how, how is that a climax? I'll tell you how. It's because the work has been finished. There's nothing more that you can add. Jesus' righteousness is enough. You know, I, I meet a lot of Christians, and a lot of them are, live in the state of, have I done enough? If I could just do a little bit more. But, but in, in that state, you're missing something. 
that Jesus is enough, that he lived the perfect life. He was, he was righteous and he, he lived it for you. When we surrender our life to Christ, we, we receive Jesus' righteousness. And so if you ever ask yourself, have I done enough, then what you're saying is Jesus didn't do enough. You see, he sat down because the wrath of God was satisfied when he was crucified on the cross. So here's the point that the author is making. In these two verses, he's packing all these things together, and he's saying, look at Jesus. In these uncertain times, In these uncertain times, look at Jesus and everything that he is. He is the heir of all things. Through him, he he made the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the imprint of God's nature. He upholds the world by his word. He made purification for sins, and he sat down. In uncertain times, don't let go of Jesus. I know that there's a feeling of of things that are pulling you away from that truth. And I just want to encourage you, you, wherever you are, do not let go of Jesus. For some of you, you've, you've never gripped Jesus. You've never surrendered your life to Jesus. I just want to encourage you to at very least look at this Jesus and who the Bible says he is. Not not the Hallmark card, not the precious moment museum in Joplin, Missouri. But who does Scripture say that Jesus is? Not the Thomas Kincaid portraits. But what does Scripture say? And I want to encourage you to investigate. And if you want to surrender your life to Christ, I I just want to encourage you to, to contact us and we'll help you through that. And just cry out to God in prayer. Say, God, I love you so much. I I, I recognize that I need a Savior. And and give your life to him. But here's the other thing. In uncertain times, we don't let go of Jesus. What if if during this time, what if during this trial, what if during this COVID-19 thing, as, as the world is uncertain and you're continuing to grip Jesus, for those of you who have already surrendered your life to Christ, what would happen if you gripped him so tightly that your relationship with him grew? Just think about that. We have all this time on our, all this time now. All Soccer has been canceled. Gymnastics has been canceled. There, wherever it is in your season of life, I know a lot of people are finding that they have a lot of time on their hands. And most often what happens is that when we have a lot of time on our hands, we pick up our phones and we just start scrolling. And we just try and and intake as much information as possible. And a lot of times what happens is that after we have this this binge watching of the news, we feel more depressed than when we started. But what if if during this time of COVID-19, you took the time and you said, you know what, I'm going to grip Jesus tighter. What if in this season, it wasn't a season of fear, but a season of growth? What if 10 years from now, 15 years from now, when you look back and you talk about this season with your grandchildren or with your kids, you would be able to tell them, yeah, the world was unraveling. The economy was tanking. But it was during that season that I began to take my faith seriously. And it was during that season that I began to draw closer to Jesus. And it was during that season that I grew in my faith like I never had before. And as I was growing, Jesus was with me and his Holy Holy Spirit was empowering me to live the life that he intended me to live. And what if, what if, what if, what if during this time, I just want to encourage you, what if during this time you were able to offer a life preserver to somebody? What if during this time you were able to point somebody that you had been praying for for years to say, hey, you know what, let me, let me tell you about Jesus. And what if 
during that t- this time period, you led someone to Jesus. You led somebody to Christ. What if, what if during this time you look back on COVID-19 years and you were able to say, you know what? Yeah, it was a, t- a terrible time for the world. But Uncle Jared got saved. Your grandmother got saved. My coworker got saved. I just want to encourage you that during this time, instead of sinking into your fears, in uncertain times, don't allow these uncertain times for you to go back to your old way of life but to hold on to Jesus, lean into your relationship with Jesus more. Let me pray for you. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you that while the world is uncertain, you are certain. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the heir of all things. We thank you that he is unchanging. We thank you for his word that created the world. God, we thank you that he is the radiance of your glory and that we can continue to look for him and we can continue to hold on to his promises. God, you are so good to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Right now is the time in our service where we receive communion. And we invite anybody who is a believer in Christ to participate. And so I want to encourage you, as the band begins to sing, um, and as you're singing at home, I want to encourage you to go get the elements, get some juice and get some bread or whatever it is that you're going to, take, you're going to receive communion with. And we're going to sing, and when they finish singing, I'm going to come back and we'll, I'll, I'll lead you through communion. time in our service where we receive communion. And every week at Southeast Christian Church, we participate in this. 
The bread represents Jesus' body, which was crucified. The juice represents his blood, which was shed for a multitude of sins. And right now, before we receive the elements, I encourage you to go and prepare your heart to receive communion. For some of you, this may look like, um, God, I've been distant from you for a long time. But God, I'm recognizing I, I need you. I'm recognizing that this world is uncertain, but Jesus is not. And so it's a prayer of repentance. For others of you, when you approach this time in the service, you're saying, wow, God, I'm so grateful for your grace and your mercy. It's the same prayer. (laughs) It's all about Jesus. So take a few moments and go to God in prayer and prepare your heart to receive communion. Now, as they were eating it, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Go ahead and eat the bread. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Go ahead and drink the juice. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for your grace. God, we thank you that we can come before your throne. God, I know that there's a lot of people watching, and I know that there are some who are just distant. So Father, I I pray for them, that you would remind them of how close you are, and that you are a God of forgiveness and mercy and grace and Father I pray that as we remember your death, your burial and resurrection that you would give us boldness that we would listen to your spirit that we, you, that we would go where you lead us and Father I pray that as we are in these uncertain times that you would hold us close as we hold on to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now's the time in our service where we receive the offering. And so I just want to encourage you. um, I just want to encourage you. We have a phrase that we've been using around here, if I can find it. It's um, give help and get help. And this morning, as I was looking at that, I I thought, man, we really ought to change that. We ought to say, uh, give hope (laughs) and get hope. Because here's the thing, is that um, when you look at the news, the, the church shouting Jesus is what gives people hope. And so I just want to thank you for those of you that are watching and are um, supporting Southeast financially. And I want to invite you, if you don't already support Southeast financially, to, to join us. And you can give at southeast.cc backslash give and, and help us to continue to give hope to people. But I also want to point out that there's also the give, get help or get hope. 
that right now there's just a lot of uncertainty. Again, people are losing jobs, there's health issues, there's all sorts of things that are happening as, as we're kind of getting out of this and we'll see how long the ramifications um, of COVID-19 continue on. But I just want to encourage you that if you're in need to go to that community care page that we have. And there's two forms there that you can look at. One is this, we just want to pray with you. And so if you have a prayer request, we'd love to hear from you. Um, You can go and and fill out your prayer request. But if you need help, there's a tangible needs form. Let us know because we might be able to do something about it. Okay. Um, also, uh, we would love to connect with you. We have a communication card, southeast.cc backslash sermons. And we've been doing a thing um, normally when people come to the church and we give out a little bag and that bag has a little book in it and it's, you know, and it's got candy and everything that, that's tasty. And so I've been eating those bags. No, I'm kidding. I haven't been eating those bags. But, but, but here's the thing is we said, you know what, we, we're not spending any money on those. So for every communication card that we get at Southeast Christian Church every week um, until we can start meeting back in, per, in person, we're going to give $5 to the, to the rescue mission of Salt Lake. So I want to encourage you to fill out your communication card. Um, also coming up, we've got some cool things that are happening. Um, one of the cool things that is happening is that we're getting our student ministry together. So that's um, sixth through fifth grade, or uh, I can't read that, sixth through twelfth grade. Um, we're going to have a meeting Tuesday night. Um, that's this Tuesday, seven o'clock via Zoom. And we'll be sending out uh, invitations for that Zoom meeting. So I want to encourage you to, if you have kids in that age group, to. Um, Encourage them to jump on. Um, and then also make sure you're checking out our website um, update. We, we've been updating it quite a bit lately with just the happenings of the church, with the, the prayer meetings and the Bible studies and, and all the things that are going on online. And so, hey everyone, uh, again, thank you so much for watching. God bless and have a fantastic week.